Good afternoon. I don't know how long you guys have been sitting here, but if you want to stand up and stretch for a minute, do some jumping jacks, feel free. Uh, my name is uh, Rich Shank. I'm Director of Orthopedic Trauma at Morristown. And I was uh, asked to talk about fractures of the knee, which is a pretty broad topic. So we're going to look at a general evaluation, distal femur fractures, patella fractures. I'm going to just mention knee dislocations and talk about proximal tibia fractures. We're not going to talk about pediatric fractures. Each of these topics I could talk about for hours, so it's a lot of information, and I was asked to talk in 20 minutes. I'm going to try to stick to that, if not shorter. So you've had an introduction to the anatomy to the knee, and the good thing about anatomy is that it's pretty constant. So we have certain landmarks that we look at. As with any patient, you want to inspect. You can get a lot of information from just looking at uh, the knee, palpate, check range of motion, do neurovascular testing, and there are some special tests that can be done. So on inspection, you want to look for swelling or effusion, ecchymosis. Is there a skin injury? There, keep in mind there can be a significant soft tissue injury even if it's a closed injury. You can look at bruising. If you see dimpling, that's usually indicative of a fracture that's buttonholed through a fascia. You want to look at surgical scars. You want to get an idea, does the, basically does the leg look crooked or does it look straight? And usually, but not always, there's an opposite side to compare to. Palpate, you want to palpate areas of tenderness, and again, compared to the other side, are there any defects? And this will guide you as to whether you need any imaging. If there's any bony tenderness, an x-ray should be performed. So on palpation, is the skin tense or firm? You have to be concerned with the compartment syndrome, which is probably the um, bane of all orthopedic surgeons. This is usually a clinical diagnosis. Occasionally, there's a device um, made by Stryker where you can measure the compartments, but usually it's a clinical diagnosis, and the device is used only if you can't examine the patient if they're obtunded or unconscious. You want to look for the five Ps that uh, we talk about. Is it an open fracture or a closed fracture? Is it a buttonhole, or is it an obvious open injury? If you're not sure if the, there's an open injury in the knee, you can do the saline load test, where you can load the knee up with saline and see if the, the fluid extravasates through what you're worried about being an open injury. If there's any doubt, patients should be taken to the OR and washed out because the morbidity of missing an open joint injury is, is pretty high compared to the morbidity of a knee scope where you can just wash out the knee joint. So in terms of range of motion, we talk about active motion and passive motion. Always ask the patient to first move their knee, and that's active motion. What can the patient do themselves? If they can't move it at all themselves, I would say stop there and get an x-ray. If they can move their knee, then you can try passive motion, and that's you moving it within their pain tolerance. And again, is there a fusion? Is it large? Is it small? All these are factors in helping you decide what your next step is going to be. You want to do a neurovascular exam? Just asking a patient if they can wiggle their toes is not a neurovascular examination. You actually want to check all the dermatomes and all the muscle groups. You've already heard about the special uh, test for ligamentous and meniscal injuries. And one thing I want to also emphasize is that with fractures around the knee, you can also get an extensor mechanism rupture. That's a tearing of the quadriceps tendon off the patella or a tearing of the patella tendon either off the patella or off the tibial tubercle. If a patient cannot do a straight leg raise, it might be because of pain, in which case sometimes we inject the knee with some lidocaine at, to get rid of the pain component of it. If they can't do a straight leg raise, one has to be concerned with a disruption of the ex extensor mechanism. There's different criteria for whether or not and when you should get an x-ray. In my opinion, basically, if there's any bony tenderness, you should get an x-ray. MRIs are very limited in, in the scope of fractures around the knee. So what do we look at when we look at x-rays? Generally, x-rays in the knee in the trauma setting is a little different than in, in a non-traumatic setting. In the trauma setting, we usually get two x-rays, an AP and a lateral. And the thing that I want to point out is on the lateral view here, you see the two condyles overlapping each other, and that's a good lateral view. Typically, when I get x-rays on the outside and they're brought in, 
I get this all over on your far right as your lateral. That doesn't really give you the information that you need. Occasionally, oblique views are helpful in determining a tibial plateau fracture. Um, they were commonly done before CAT scans were, were so readily accessible. When I first went into practice, it was actually difficult to get a CAT scan. Uh, that's because I'm so old, but now CAT scans are readily accessible. You can also get what's called either, uh, you can get a tunnel view, and you can also get what's either called a sunrise or a skyline view to look at the patellofemoral problems. So each view gives you information. You have to remember that an x-ray is a two-dimensional picture of a three-dimensional object, which is why we get multiple views at a minimum, two views at 90 degrees, to try to put together in our heads what the problem is. It's best for bony injuries, but you can get some soft tissue information from it. So you've already heard a couple talks about anatomy, so I'm going to skip that. But it's good to repeatedly look at x-rays, even of normal x-rays, so you have an in your mind what's normal and what isn't, and not every patient reads the textbook is what normal is supposed to be. There's obviously some variation. Uh, just to mention a fabella, I'm not sure if it was mentioned in the earlier talk, it's a sesamoid bone in the lateral head of the gastrocnemius muscle. It's not a fracture. You can tell it's not a fracture because the margins are smooth and well corticated. In a fracture, at least an acute fracture, the margins are always irregular and jagged. Sometimes we see what's called a bipartite patella. That's a patella that has not completely fused. And on palpation in this area, it would be non-tender if there's no fracture. And if you're concerned that it might be a fracture, in this case, an MRI might be useful. But by physical examination and x-ray, you can usually tell if it's a bipartite patella or a fracture. So again, you should have a systematic review of how you look at a knee x-ray, just like you should have a systematic review on how you do everything. That way you're less likely to miss anything. You start from point A, you go to point whatever. Your systematic review may be different than someone else's, and that's okay, but you should follow the same pattern whenever you look at things. So one way to do that is you can outline all the bones, either literally draw on the x-ray or in your mind. Uh, in a fracture, there will be an irregularity, a, a sharp area, an edge. Uh, if it's smooth, it's probably not a fracture. So we're going to touch on distal femur fractures, which I could probably talk like uh, several hours on. The distal femur is divided into a couple of areas. One is called the supracondylar areas, which means just what it says, above the condyles. And that's the area that you see here. And then the, these are the two condyles. There's the medial femoral condyle and the lateral femoral condyle. The distal femur has a, a shape that's important for us as surgeons to know. For example, it's narrower anteriorly than it is posteriorly, and that matters where we put our plate. If we put our plate here, it will affect the alignment compared to putting it here. So we need to know for that manufacturer, was that plate designed to be placed more anterior or was it designed to be placed more posterior? So distal femur fractures have a bimodal distribution. We see them in young patients with high energy, motor vehicle accidents, motorcycles, horseback riding, or we see them in elderly patients which are relatively low, injury, uh, low energy injuries. The classification for femur fractures is used, useful for uh, research. Type A is an extra articular, in other words, the fracture does not involve the joint, and then from one, two, and three depends on the amount of comminution or the amount of pieces. A B type is a fracture only involving a condyle, and it could be a medial condyle, lateral condyle, or a posterior condyle. And then type C is um, based on the amount of comminution above the joint and the amount of comminution in the joint, or both. Most of these, if not all of these, need surgery. So here's an example of an A1, which is a supracondylar fracture above the joint, not comminuted, mainly two pieces. Here's a, an A3 showing a supracondylar femur fracture not involving the joint that has several pieces. This is the type B fracture involving only the medial femoral condyle. In this case, it's non-displaced, as you see from the fracture line. And in this picture, you see in the middle x-ray 
the fracture line here of the posterior condyle, also known as a Hoffa fracture. And this picture shows a, a type C2 fracture. That's a fracture that involves the joint, and the portion above the joint or the supracondylar portion is very comminuted. So we need to inspect, again, look to see if it's an open fracture or not, because that's going to change your management and how quickly you need to address this patient. Initially, patients are placed into a big bulky dressing called a Jones dressing and an immobilizer or a long leg splint until they're ready for surgery. If it's a high energy injury, they tend to swell quite a bit, which makes definitive treatment uh, not possible initially. We image them, as mentioned, we need to know whether it's intraarticular or not. Typically, if we think that there's too much swelling to definitively treat a patient, we will place an external fixator, pull traction, and then get a CAT scan when things are in, in more reasonable position. If we don't think we need to do that, do that, we'll get a CAT scan before surgery and plan on doing everything in one stage. So here's an example of a distal femur fracture. An external fixative was placed. In this case, the alignment is not great, but the most important thing is getting the length. And then the patient was brought back to the operating room. This is during the course of surgery. This is a fluoroscopic picture. You can see the fracture of the posterior condyle fixed here. The alignment is obtained here, temporarily fixed with two cross K wires to allow for placement of a, a rod and a plate in this case, which is unusual. Usually it's one or the other. So again, we want to temporize the fractures that we don't think we can fix in one sitting, and that would be because of swelling. And then we then bring them back and most often use plates and screws as a construct, occasionally uh, rods. So on your left, you see an example of the external fixator on this patient's injury. And here's the plate and screws. And this is looking at it from the front. This is an AP view. This is a lateral view. And over on the right, you see uh, treatment with a rod and a surclage wire. Generally, surclage wires are uh, poo-pooed uh, in the treatment of fractures because it's, they're thought to disrupt the blood supply to the fragment and the fragment uh, may not go on to heal. So you've heard about the soft tissue of the knee. Let's go on to the patella. The patella is the largest sesamoid uh, in the body. It increases the mechanical advantage of your extensor mechanism. The quadriceps inserts to the top of it or the proximal pole. The patella tendon inserts onto the inferior pole and there's a strong soft tissue on either side of it. So how do we injure patella? It's from one of two ways. The most common way is from an indirect force. We slip or fall and we get uh, forceful contraction of our quadriceps and the patella fractures, and we usually get a transverse pattern. Uh, the other way is direct blow, such as a uh, knee against a dashboard or direct strike, like a baseball bat against uh, the patella. And those are usually uh, multifragmentary or comminuted patterns. So at the top, you see a non-displaced transverse fracture. This is a displaced transverse fracture. These are from indirect means. The fractures on the bottom here is from a direct means, from a direct blow. When looking at the x-rays, we want to get an idea of whether the patella tendon or the quadriceps tendon is ruptured, and that's going to be determined by where the patella is sit seated on the lateral view. There are certain ratios that we look at between how long the patella tendon should be compared to the patella, and uh, it's usually not a very difficult diagnosis. I also want to emphasize that a patella dislocation is not the same thing as a knee dislocation. A knee dislocation is a potentially devastating injury that needs to be addressed rapidly. A patella dislocation is nowhere near as, as serious. So here's a transverse patella fracture, AP and lateral views. Here's a uh, vertical patella fracture, which rarely needs surgical intervention. You always want to look to see if it's an open fracture or not. Can a patient do a straight leg raise? If they can, it means that the extensor mechanism is intact which would mean the quadriceps tendon, the patella, and patella tendon are not disrupted. 
So when do we and when we don't do surgery? We can basically do surgery if the patient can do a straight leg raise and if there's a minimum articular step off. There's really no golden number as to what that is, and that may vary from person to person based on their training and experience. If it's going to be non-operative, the patients get immobilized with their knee straight for a couple of weeks, and then they usually get placed into a hinge knee brace to start mobilizing the knee so it doesn't get stiff. All open fractures need to be operated on. If a patient cannot do a straight leg raise or there's a large articular step off, these need to be fixed. There's different ways to fix these. The picture on your left is a cerclage wire. The middle picture is a, called a tension band wire. And the picture on your right would be a hybrid type fixation with plates and screws. So here's an example of what's called a tension band wire, which is very effective treatment for this injury. And here's other different constructs and combinations based on the amount of pieces there are and where they are. I show this picture because here's a patella fracture that was fairly simple, it was transverse, and the patient uh, did not want an open incision. So when one of the surgeons she saw decided that they would do this percutaneously, which they did with these screws and washers. The problem is that there's a large articular step off, and this is going to be doomed to post-traumatic arthritis. Here's another patella fracture, transverse in nature, relatively easy to fix, tension band wiring with screws, and you can see a large gap in the fracture. This probably will not heal. There's a gap because the threads are in the fracture site, keeping it from being compressed. Fractures heal very well when they're compressed. When they're not compressed, they frequently do not heal. So surgical technique is very important. Here's another transverse fracture treated with a screw and tension band wire. And I just show you this because while the reduction is pretty good, you can see how long these wires are rather than being cut flush with the bone. So every time this patient would try to bend their knee, they would have pain from the wire sticking into their thigh. So there's all different ways to fix these. Sometimes they're not fixable. This was a knee, knee against the dashboard. Postoperatively, these patients should be able to be made weight bearing tolerated. They're usually given crutches just to help them with balance. And we're going to move on to tibial plateau fractures now. So tibial plateau fractures in the trauma world are commonly uh, produced from a bumper injury. And here's an example of a tibial plateau fracture. And if you look at the x-ray, there's a depression of the joint here, you can see the knee is subluxed, and the fracture actually comes all the way down to here. So there's a difference between low energy and high en energy in terms of how we look at these. If it's a high energy injury, such as this one, which is the same picture as this, it needs to be treated much more aggressively and in stages versus one that's low energy. If a patient has pre-existing arthritis, that will change the management of management as well, and some of them just go on to a primary um, knee replacement. I'm not going to talk about the anatomy or the muscle insertions. Again, soft tissue injury. This patient on the right here is a longshoreman who fell, broke his tibia out to sea. It took them five days to get him back to shore, and you can see it's, it's a closed fracture, but the extensive soft tissue injury delaying definitive treatment. So when we look at x-rays, what do we look at? We're looking at a couple of things. The end of the femur should line up with the top of the tibia. And we want to look at the joint line and see if there's any disruption. And sometimes it can be deceiving that it's, it's difficult to see. If you look on the picture on your right, there's an inclination of the joint line. So if you take an x-ray in this plane, you may miss some injury to the joint. So the beam of the x-ray should be more in this direction. And occasionally, as I mentioned before, oblique x-rays are obtained to get more information on the, the plateau. So we look at the picture on the right. You see here's the joint knocked down to here. 
and the tibial plateau is widened compared to the distal femur. The lateral tibial plateaus usually occur from a valgus or knock knee stress where the end of the femur acts as a battering ram and knocks down the joint surface of the tibia. And CTs are invaluable in the assessment of these injuries. So we talk about classification of uh, tibial plateau fractures. They were came up with by uh, Dr. Shasker, who I, who I had the opportunity to do some of my fellowship with. In uh, 1979, he wrote a landmark paper on the classification and treatment of these, which revolutionized how we treat these today, and very little has actually changed. There are six types of plateau fractures, and on the, this should be a type one, it's just a condyle fracture, there's no joint depression. If you put this whole piece up here, the joint will be restored. A type two is a split of the condyle and a joint depression. Here's the joint here, that's knocked down. A type three is a pure depression. There's no exit of the fracture out the condyle, and this is usually seen in elderly patients. As we go up the scale, the amount of energy absorbed by the limb goes up. A type four, which is here, is a medial plateau fracture, which most people akin to a knee dislocation and a, a very careful vascular uh, examination is required, and these all need to be fixed. This is a type five, where it involves the la medial plateau and the lateral plateau, but there's still continuity of the shaft. And a type six is where there's no continuity of the shaft and both condyles are involved. So historically, these plateau fractures were treated with traction and casting, and the results were horrible. And as I said, in 1979, Dr. Schatzker came out with his landmark paper. He also was instrumental in designing implants to fix these fractures. And uh, we like to think that our treatment for these are much better today and continues to evolve. So when do we operate? Well, articular step off is not really a good indication. You'd think it would be. But the knee can actually tolerate a lot of joint depression, and it also depends where the depression is. The most reliable way to tell if someone needs surgery on a depressed plateau fracture is by taking them to the operating room, giving them some sedation, and doing a valgus stress of their knee in 30 degrees. And if it opens more than 15 degrees on the opposite side, then it should be fixed. All type four, fives, and sixes should be fixed as well. So our treatment goals are to have the patient be pain-free, restore range of motion, have them have a normal gait, and get back to normal activities. We need to restore the patient's length of their limb, their mechanical axis, and their joint congruity. And of course, we want to avoid infection. There's different ways to treat these plateau fractures. Casting is pretty uncommon. An external fixator is usually used as provisional treatment for the first week or two or maybe three until soft tissue swelling resolves. Spatial frames are rarely used in this part of the country for these fractures. In other parts of the world, they're used commonly. And it should be intramedullary nail is sometimes used. But the workhorse is plates and screws. So if you have a limb like this and you're going to stage the treatment, you need to know where you're going to put your external fixator pins. You don't want to put them in the zone of injury. And you don't want to put them where potentially your plate and screws are going to be because it'll potentially increase your infection rate. So sometimes we actually draw out on the patient's leg where different things are. This is an example of a spatial frame, which as I said, in this part of the country is rarely used for these fractures. And there's different ways that these can be fixed. On your left, you see a tibial rod and a plate uh, and screws. On the right, you see a screw and a tibial rod but this is the workhorse. On your left, you see a lateral plate with multiple screws. The middle picture is a medial and lateral plate based on the fracture geometry. And the picture on your right are actually three plates, uh, medial, lateral, and posterior. So here's a case I showed you before. This is actually a lady that fell down a flight of stairs. That she was brought to Overlook. They felt uncomfortable treating her, so she was transferred here. She had a lot of swelling. So she was brought to the OR, and I placed an external fixator. Now, if you look at this, you say, you know, this looks pretty good in the external fixator. 
getting the CAT scan after the external fixer was placed, you can see a big piece of the joint is knocked down well below the articular surface. So about three and a half weeks later when her swelling improved to allow for two incisions, she was brought back for a surgical reconstruction with two plates and, two, and uh, multiple screws. So the most common complication of treating these injuries is orthofibrosis or a stiff knee. The more complicated the fracture, the less likely someone will get full range of motion, so we want them to get functional range of motion. In other words, we want them to get range of motion that allows them to do the things that they want to do. Occasionally, there are ligamentous injuries that get addressed later, and uh, meniscal injuries get addressed later as well. It's really not feasible to address them at the time of taking care of the fracture. Some of these patients do go on to post-traumatic arthritis and do end up needing knee replacements. We're always concerned about compartment syndrome in the early stages of the injury and following the surgery. And we're always wary of nerve and arterial injuries. Outcomes we know are better in patients who are younger, less than 40. If the fracture is unicondylar or on one side of the knee, they have good bone stock, it makes the reconstruction better. If there's less than five degrees of axis deviation of what's normal alignment, and they have better results if they do not have a meniscal tear or a ligament tear. And of course, if they don't have an infection, that helps their outcomes as well. About 20% of these patients will have a secondary procedure of some sort. That's it. Any questions? Yes. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Okay, so damage control orthopedics, I was found out yesterday I was supposed to talk on it, so I didn't prepare a talk. Damage control orthopedics is when a patient comes in, usually multiply injured, and in the old days we used to fix everything at once. And the trend now is to fix the most critical things and to do provisional treatments such as external fixation and then bring patients back in stages as they get better to fix each injury. So if a patient has five different broken bones, we may put on five external fixators, and then a few days later, take one off and fix that bone. A few days later, fix the other bone. We think physiologically it's better for patients. Anything else? Okay, thank you. Thank you.